At the end of the second talk, I want to tell you about some of the things I'm really excited about on the research front, and there'll sort of be more technical details of tricks and models. And we'll get there. I want to start a bit more broadly thinking about sort of why we're here, why we build these models, and also I want to get to know you a bit more. So I'm going to start sort of trying to motivate what we're doing and thinking about machine learning. And when people ask me what I do and they ask what machine learning is, I often find myself telling them about the applications, even though really I sort of work on the core methodology and I am excited about applications, but I'm not the expert on any individual one. And some of you here will actually be here because you're excited about a particular application, whether it's machine translation or cosmology or building up your local economy or whatever it is. So I think the core machine learning people, we have to remember that it's really the applications that are why we do this stuff and it's the thing that is easy to communicate about and we have to form this common language. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about applications. So the first one is, if you have to explain to someone what machine learning is, and you want to give them like a prototypical example of machine learning, what's, the, what's the, uh, your favorite go-to application? So like, any, any ideas, what would you say first? You must have done this, your friends and family ask you. Yeah. AlphaGo, yeah, so it's really cool, right? This ancient board game was the prototype example of like, this is something computers can't do, and it's been smashed by machine learning. So, you know, awesome success for machine learning, yeah. Fa face recognition. I really like that one because most people have phones in their pockets. I don't, but if you pull out the phone and you hold it up, it's immediately putting boxes around people's faces. That's face detection rather than recognition, but um, it's an immediately something that they might not have thought about, but it's in their pocket, and you can tell them, you know, actually a machine learning system was shown a load of faces and worked out how to do that for itself. Um, and then recognition, these social media sites are now beginning to recognize that not just that there's a face there, but whose face it is, and you know, it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Cooling data centers. So, um, you know, energy, one of our biggest problems going forward. If we don't sort out our energy, then we're in big trouble. And this is like one example of something we can do. It's not going to solve all our problems, but like we may as well do it. So, something people can relate to. Are there any, these are all like kind of big things, right? They're, they're big systems. Like, what are the simplest things? What's the sort of simplest machine learning example? Information filtering, what does that mean? Oh, personalized information filtering. So like if you're doing searches, um, maybe it works out that when you search for LaTeX, you want typesetting advice and not fancy dress clothing. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, okay, and so and what are the applications that you're most excited about? So like what, why are you here and you, you, what field do you actually want to advance with machine learning? Robotics. I've talked to a cosmologist, and you know, so it's a whole variety of fields. And whenever you see one of these individual examples, it's not necessarily clear like how it would apply to you. And I think it's worth going through this thought process to think, well, how do we teach people how to use machine learning? How do we teach them to take it to their new application that might be quite different? So I've got an outline here of some different applications that sort of, with my thoughts of how they link together. So for me, the the simplest canonical machine learning thing is a straight up classification problem where you have some features in some simple form, some numbers, and you want to say what sort of thing is this bag of numbers. So things like spam classification was one of the sort of oldest things where people went, oh yeah, this is a machine learning system. Sort of as soon as Gmail was released, it had a spam filter. And it's something that takes some counts of some words in the simplest form and then uh, gives you a label that says whether it's spam or not. Um, and you know, this is where all the money is, like click prediction. If I show this ad, will someone click on it? Yes or no? Um, and face detection you could think of as a classification problem. So if I put a box here, does it contain a face or not? You can reduce it to a classification problem. What if I put the box here? What if I put the box here? So you can slide a box around and wait until your classifier fires and you go, there's the face. And the reason it's good to sort of think about, well, how do I boil something down to a classification problem is that uh, 
you have to work out how to put the numbers into the computer. So if I'm going to put this image into a classifier to do face detection, I have to think, how do I represent pixels? And I might not be writing a smartphone app. I might be doing disease diagnosis. I might want to know, oh, is my crop, uh, does it have this disease? And farmers are going to put smartphone cameras on it. But I can look up the papers where they did some other image thing, and I think, OK, if there was a simple task that I can understand, what's the nearest neighbor task? I can do machine learning across um, machine learning tasks and figure out how to do that. Um, and there's a, there was a piece of machine learning advice I picked up from Twitter. And if someone knows who said this, please tell me, because I want to cite them. Someone said, like, what's the apply number one piece of applied machine learning advice? Uh, go to one of the top meetings, like ICML or NIPS, or NeurIPS, and say, What's the paper that's sort of got a good recognition, a paper award on the task that you want? Or what's the nearest paper to the task you want? Read the paper and look at the dumb baseline they compare to and implement that. Because that's the simplest thing of like taking your data in and doing something with it. There's probably code available because they were too lazy to implement the baseline, so they'll have picked something that you can get running quickly um, and they didn't have to tune too much because they weren't interested in it. So it's these sort of basic tasks where we can reduce it to a simple yes no question or a simple question and see how other people re represent things that are our starting points. Whereas a lot of the things that are exciting are much richer tasks like that. So I think machine translation is one of the sort of biggest poster child success stories of machine learning, and it's a text to text problem. It doesn't get text and say, this is spam or not. It spits out a whole sequence of words. Um, and you can do image captioning. You could generate images. You can generate speech. So we're interested in things that have a rich variety of outputs, not just a rich variety of inputs. And we have to work out how to represent those. And you know, it's not obvious. So I've just heard that there's been massive success in protein folding from machine learning you know, just in the last few months. And I haven't read that paper yet. So I do not know immediately how I would represent a protein fold using numbers and as the output of a neural network. I can think of ways of doing it. But I'll be interested to see how they've done it. And that's where a lot of the difficult challenges are for new applications. So these are ways of breaking down the problems, but of course we're interested in these bigger problems. So AlphaGo you know, is um, a big success story, but it contains within it lots of subparts. And how do you start working on one of those problems? Well, the first thing people did when wanting to do computer Go programming was like, let's train a classifier. The first thing we'll do is work out how to represent the board and work out how to copy moves of humans and like do a classification problem of where's the next move. It's not the way to solve the whole problem, um, but it's a starting point that lets you see whether you can at all represent your problem. Um, I put self-driving cars here because there was a couple of years where every single student I talked to coming to the university, I said, oh, what do you want to do in the future? And they'd say, oh, I really want to be someone who develops self-driving cars. So it's, it's clearly something that it excites people, but you know, it's not a machine learning problem. It's many machine learning problems um, all put together. And by the end of the um, talk, I want to say how I think some of these machine learning ideas fit together for scientific inference. So here's the thread of the, the sessions. Um, I'm going to argue again that I think we want to start thinking about the simplest uh, systems, so things like classifiers, and think what's special about just those, what are the challenges in machine learning in those, and get us to think about AI more generally, and I'll use that to motivate building models with richer outputs and density estimation, the probabilistic modeling I'm interested in, and eventually we'll get to how that feeds into scientific inference. So um, for the moment, let's say that I'm doing intro machine learning and I want to fit a spam classifier, so I've been given the task it's 1998, I'm on the Gmail team, and they're like, okay, we need a spam classifier. We're gonna have this uh, text emails, and you need to write a function, as in a piece of computer code, that will be part of our system that takes in this text and has some output that we'll then use to filter the mail and do stuff. Okay, so what could this function be? What sort of thing is it? What's the simplest way we could do spam classification? An if statement, so if what? <laughs> okay, oh, we, could think about, we could think about it the other way. What, how are we going to represent our email? An email is a bunch of text. How are we going to turn that into stuff that we're going to, what's the input to this function going to be? We, we're going to have a bunch of text originally, but what's the first thing we're going to do to that text, if anything? 
one hot encoding. So we could just say which words are in this email. We could maybe have counts of how many t times did the, the words appear. So we might reduce uh, text data down and upset the NLP linguist, but uh, we might reduce the text down to some simple form and a bunch of numbers. So I could have a big binary feature vector that says these words appeared in this email. And that's like the baseline task. That's how it used to work. Um, and then what would this function be? What would we do with that vector? Frequency count. So yeah, the, so for example, you know, naive Bayes classification used to be really popular where you could just count how many words are in each email, have a very simple probabilistic model that say, well, here are the statistics for our bucket of spam emails, here are the statistics for our bucket of non-spam emails, which of those two models is a better match? And then this output would be allegedly a probability that the email is spam or not. Although when you look at those probabilities, they would be 0.9999999999 or 0.0000001. It would be incredibly, incredibly confident, and then it would be wrong 10% of the time. So you wouldn't trust the probabilities of that output. Really, you just see it as a score saying, I'm going to output big numbers when it looks like spam, and we will then do something to work out where we're going to cut that s score and work out what we're going to do. It would be nice if we could trust probabilities on the output because then we could like just reason about those probabilities and uh, decide what policy to take. Um, you're, you've been at a machine learning summer school for a, for a week, so what's a fancier method than naive Bayes that we can put in here? It's not a trick question. Don't be shy. Sorry? A deep neural network, yes. So we can have naive Bayes. We could have some sort of deep neural network, a very complicated representation of a function that takes this thing in. Um, we could go further and say, well, what's the latest papers in the, the meetings? And it's like, okay, machine translation uses the transformer and self-attention. We could go back to having the full text here and try and model stuff. We would also talk to the spam guys, and they would go, oh, there's a bunch of other features, by the way, like we know things about mail hosts and things that appear in headers. Maybe extract a load of features from that. Maybe just throw all of that into the neural network. Um, and then in between, there might be some intermediate things that are a little bit simpler and not quite as bad as naive Bayes that you might consider. Like, you know, machine learning in the 1990s was basically logistic regression. Um, there's very fast, good implementations of logistic regression that would do a reasonable job and be super fast. And in one pass through your email would fit a reasonable model. And, you know, advert prediction and... Uh, email spam classification used to all be stochastic gradient descent on logistic regression for a, a big chunk of time, and that's a good place to start as well. And you need these baselines so that when you run your big deep neural network, which doesn't usually work first time, you know what sort of number you need to beat and what, what a, good, a good place to be is. Okay, so the reason that we go to the deep neural network is this thing I showed you yesterday. The biggest problem in machine learning is probably underfitting Emails are really complicated objects, and we're never going to capture all of the complexity in language, but we want to build really rich, complicated functions, because if we have simple functions, then we're never going to get the accuracy that we could get. Um, any reasoning we do where we underfit things doesn't do well. And earlier in the summer school, you heard about Gaussian processes. So there was this idea that, oh, well, uh, flexible things like Gaussian processes or large neural networks can fit anything. So if you've got nonlinear data, you can fit it. Um, and we've just had a lovely talk about whether we, you really can just throw large architectures at things like text and expect them to generalize well and understand them. So thinking about this idea of, well, just having really flexible models and whether any flexible model will do, um, I'd like to show you, I think, um, again, this quote from David Mackay. I think Neil Laurent uh, has this quote in his notes as well, but it's so good I'm going to give it to you again. So this excellent textbook, which is available free online, contains um, the statement that says, according to the hype of 1987, neural networks are intelligent models that can discover features and patterns, whereas Gaussian processes, these large flexible models, are just simple smoothing devices. So for example, if I was doing one-dimensional curve fitting, I don't need to do any learning. I could just say, I want to make a prediction at some point. I want to make a prediction at some point. What's the nearest data point I've seen? Oh, it's pretty nearby. I'll just steal its output. Um, so I haven't fit a model, but I can still draw a curve through all of these points. And I could do some sort of smoothing. So there's um, a blue smooth curve going through these points where 
I've just looked at a few nearby points and averaged them or taken a weighted averaging. So like, have I done any artificial intelligence there? Do I expect it to generalize in an interesting way as spammers adjust their email or in any real situation, is it going to do something? We want, we want to do more than just smoothing. Um, but, this quote continued, the many real world data problems are perfectly well served by smoothing. Lots of the time, the most common cases of things we see are much like things we've seen before, and we can just spit out the answer of what we saw before. Um, and at the front here, what we're trying to do is really do something more interesting, discover features and do something interesting. And it's a perpetual question to what extent machine learning really does that. So there was skepticism back when this textbook was written that maybe multi-layer perceptrons, deep neural networks, can't solve these feature problems either. And it's this ongoing question in linguistics as to how they will generalize. So I don't know exactly where on this spectrum I lie, but it's pretty clear to me that there's some really interesting things going on in machine learning. We've just got to be careful not to overclaim them. And the first time that I was really convinced that neural networks did feature discovery, to me, that was surprising, um, was when I saw some results to do with an autoencoder. So um, who knows what an autoencoder is? OK, who doesn't? OK, so. Um, for those who don't know, um, the brave ones who said they don't know, uh, an autoencoder is just a standard neural net. So neural net stuff happens. doesn't matter what sort of neural net it is. You put in an input, and the output is the same size as the input. So if you put in an image, the output is also an image. And you train it so that when you put in an image, it tries to make the output image very similar to the image you put in. So it's the identity function. It's a function that just returns its input. It's a very easy function for us to write by hand, but we write that function using a really complicated neural network just because. Um, so we do things like impose bottlenecks on the neural network or add noise or sparsity to try and learn some interesting representation of the image to get a compact or sparse representation of the image. So there was this paper that was at ICML in 2012, and I remember particularly seeing this paper because ICML we hosted in Edinburgh, so it was at home university, and there was this paper um, from a team at Google that at the time trained what to me seemed an outrageously large neural network. So it had a billion free parameters. These days people are training uh, neural nets with a billion parameters all the time, but this was the first time it had been done, I think. And they took a lot of data from YouTube. So they just took still frames of images from YouTube, and they did this autoencoding task. So they put in YouTube, neural net stuff happened, and they tried to get it to map out things that looked like YouTube. And within this deep neural network, buried within it, there's a lot of intermediate computations. It works out a bunch of numbers. And they found one of those intermediate computations, so one of the hidden unit values inside this neural net, and they found that that took on a large number, or in sort of neural terms, it was like a firing neuron, when the input image contained a face. So here are a bunch of images that were examples of images that made this, auto, this unit in this autoencoder happy. And they're not all faces, so that's some sort of ball. Um, so it's not a perfect face detector. It's not as good as the one that we train, given labels of faces. But this is something that it appears to have discovered for itself because we just gave it unlabeled images. There was no, nothing in the data that said some of these things contain faces, some don't, or which ones do. We just said, here, ir ir images represent them. And if you are sort of overly excited about these things, you want to immediately go, oh, it's learnt, learnt what a face is, because there's this number that corresponds to faces. But I'm always a bit skeptical about that claim. Like, if I run um, Gaussian process code on my laptop here, I might be able to find a transition that fires a lot when I take the Kaleski decompositions. I could go, ah, I found the Kaleski decomposition transistor in my laptop. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. And these researchers were also skeptical. So they said, does this neuron really represent faces, or is this some statistical coincidence, a correlation that doesn't really mean anything? So what they did was they went back to the neural net, and they said, there's an intermediate number in here somewhere that we want to be high, and we're going to optimize this image to make that intermediate number buried in the neural net as big as possible. So we'll start with random pixels, and we'll run an optimizer to move around an image space and find an image that makes this number big. 
and that was the image. So at the time, I was very surprised by this result um, that you could just look at a load of images and you could really get things that correspond to sort of interpretable objects to us. And they could go in, they found another neuron that generated cat images. Again, with no labels of cats' faces, it had just decided to separate these things. Um, and it seems really compelling, although we don't know exactly what's going on, exactly how this will generalize, or how to transfer this knowledge to other problems. So what they did was they took the features from this neural net and they put them into a classifier, and that classifier worked a lot better than just training a neural net image recognition system from scratch. So there is something in these representations, and it is useful, but we don't necessarily know exactly how to use it or exactly how safe it will be to use when we move to other image domains, but it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm just going to think it's pretty cool. I was pretty depressed when I saw this paper because they tra trained it on a thousand machines. This paper is actually sort of famous in machine learning for being incredibly wasteful of compute resources and having a bad distributed algorithm. And in the same year, um, a PhD student in Toronto sort of made strives on ImageNet using a single GPU, sort of, so literally training something in his bedroom got better classification results than this very large scale thing. So I was temporarily really worried about the future of machine learning only living in industry and then faith restored that uh, you can actually do things on single machines. And that keeps happening to me. I keep seeing things and thinking, oh, that's a sickening amount of compute resource. And then realizing that when you're clever, you can actually still do things. Okay, um, this story repeats. So uh, this was a blog post by OpenAI and they took a paper from our group in Edinburgh, so this is Ben Krause's work um, on multiplicative LSTM. So it's a sequence model on characters um, using no linguistic knowledge and um, not uh, uh, treating text responsibly. We didn't, uh, when we've uh, modeled characters, we haven't even looked at what a character is. We've just modeled the UTF-8 byte stream because we're not NLP researchers. And um, this group at OpenAI uh, went large with this model. So they fit it on a very large corpus of reviews that people had written in Amazon. And they did the same game where they went in and they found a neuron within this model that seemed to correspond to something that wasn't labeled. So it seemed to correspond to the sentiment of the review, whether this was a positive review that was going to get a lot of stars or a negative review where they didn't like the product. And there was no labels of that. So it seemed to be discovering some very high level feature. And I think it's pretty, it's, I was surprised that this could happen, but you can begin to see if you just sort of predict characters yourself. So you see the beginning of some text, and then you're very uncertain about what the next character is going to be because you've no idea what the word is, but you can get guesses. And then when you see that, there's very few characters that will, in comparison, that would follow after that letter. So it's a really, it's a really sh, sh, it's a really sh, it's a really shining example of like what sort of product we should have here. So if in the previous text, you'd known the sentiment of the review, if you'd sort of got a sense of whether this person liked it or not, um, or if you'd seen their star rating, um, that would help you predict which word you were going to say. And it does actually help at this character level. Um, whether or not this model would actually accurately predict the sentiment in another corpus of text, I'm skeptical. Um, but it has learned something useful. Okay, um, so I'm going to sort of pull this philosophy together and get somewhere in a bit. But um, one of my bugbears at summer schools is that we learn the most complicated stuff and some of the biggest models. And then when I sit down with people with real problems, I really want to say, no, no, let's do the simplest thing first and get some baseline numbers. So I've shown you these neural nets that had a billion parameters in them, and I just want to show you some really cool pictures with a linear model, just so that you don't get the wrong idea. So here's something that you, I, I'm going to be interested to see if you've seen before. Um, lo lots of people have image data sets, so we might bung that in a matrix. Every row of this matrix is an image, and every so, yeah, and every column corresponds to a pixel. So we've got an image of a face and we unwrap it into one long vector and we put it in a row of this matrix. And one of the things that we might want to do if we fit a baseline model is reduce the dimensionality of this. So if we've got even tiny image patches, 100 by 100, we've got a 10,000 dimensional data set and that's a pain. So if we wanted to do something super simple, what would be 
the first way that we might try and cut down the size of this data set, what machine learning method would we use? PTA. So PTA is one of the ways you could do it. You could do a random projection. You could just pick the first columns. You could make it an even tighter, tinier image patch. But I like PTA, so let's do PTA. Um, OK, so what PTA would normally do is we've got D uh, columns, number of pixels, maybe 100,000. And we would pick some smaller dimensionality, like 10. And we would say, let's make it only have 10 columns. And we'd have a data set that's number of images by 10 columns. And we'd run our code, and we'd get it. If you haven't done this or seen it, Google something like eigenfaces, and you'll get some idea of what sort of thing it would do. But did I mention I'm a really sucky programmer? I think I mentioned that before. Um, I often like don't read the documentation. I'll just run stuff and see what happens. So if I put my matrix in the wrong way around, the wonderful thing about all this code is that it will just run anyway and do something else. So I could transpose this matrix. And instead of saying, please give me 10 columns and a load of images, I could reduce it so it's got the same number of columns but only 10 rows. So then I'd be learning something about what the pixels mean rather than what the images are. And I could reduce the data set down to two dimensions if I wanted to do visualization. So what I did was I got a bunch of image patches, and then I ran PCA on them. But rather than reducing the dimensionality of an image, I got the whole data set and tried to learn what the pixels mean. So every pixel was every column of this matrix, which was the pixel was represented by what its value is in the data set. I reduced that enormous vector of maybe a million items down to two numbers. So here is a scatter plot of those two numbers. Every cross on this diagram is one of the pixels. And I've just plotted it in 2D. And I've just joined them up in a grid so it's easier to see them. So this algorithm didn't know the layout of the pixel grid. I'd have got exactly the same results if I'd shuffled the columns and plotted them. But it's totally obvious in an image data set that the pixels are laid out on some sort of grid and which ones are next to each other. Um, who's seen that before? Um, um, so I just think that it's very surprising how neatly this comes out. Um, it's one of these things that like, once people know it, they go, oh, yeah, that's obvious. But I, I wasn't clear to me that just running PCA, it, it would drop out. And I find it a bit sad for the state of machine learning, because I don't think that any of our architectures really exploit the fact that this is so obvious. If we want to exploit the pixel grid in images, we either hand code a ConfNet that knows the images, and we can't shuffle the pixels, so it has to be laid out correctly, or we use a dense neural network, and it has to sort of <laughs> discover that there are filters that should be the same in different parts of the images altogether. There's not part of the network that goes, oh, this stuff is obviously on a grid. Therefore, I will use this structure in my model and build in a ConfNet. Um, so you know, we're, we're far from general artificial intelligence, because we never have that sort of insight. The insight is done by human researchers that put it in. Um, so as you haven't seen that, I'm going to show you one more PCA example, just to show that you don't need big neural networks to get cool figures. Um, this was a paper in Nature more than 10 years ago. And it's an example of how you just need to pick the right data set in the pre-processing, and something simple will work. So um, this was a data set with 1,000 people, and they were chosen very carefully. So these were all Europeans who had two parents who were also European who'd grown up in the same local area of Europe. So people whose families hadn't migrated a lot recently, so they had some sort of location. And then we extracted, they extracted, 200,000 features from the genome of each of these people. So they sequenced their DNA, and then they had 200,000 binary variables saying, is in this location of their genome, do they have the normal A, C, G, or T that most people have? Most people have a G there. Do they have a G, or do they have something else? So they've got these binary vectors for each person. And they brutally crushed those 200,000 dimensional vectors down to two dimensions. So we've got this enormous high dimensional data set. We tumble it. We smash it down into 2D, and we draw a scatter plot. And that was a scatter plot. So you get a map of Europe, and all the people from Spain 
are from Spain, all the people from the UK are from the UK, and it's almost perfectly laid out. So the dominant form of variation in the genome is the fact that people migrated over Europe over time, and there's a correlation there that the genome also mutated over time, and you pull out these Fourier modes of the diffusion in the first few principal components, and the first two principal components are the two main directions of the diffusion. I, I was shocked when I saw this picture. Um, I think it's amazingly cool that like, this simple linear dimensionality reduction method tells you what the main sources of variation are. So like, just because you've spent a, a week hearing about deep neural networks, please don't forget the first few chapters of the machine learning books. Um, so um, I really like the modern visualization methods. So uh, t -SNE and UMAP were, while t -SNE was mentioned in the previous talk as a way of introspecting the hidden units of a neural network, and UMAP is another similar method that has a very good fast Python package available. Um, I found both of those methods very useful for trying to understand what's being captured in the hidden layers of a neural net and for visualizing data. But I've also had data sets where those things fall flat on the floor and don't work at all, and the PCA visualization looks amazing. So try all of them, and I wish I could tell you in advance which ones would work when, but I can't, and if anyone has ideas on that, please tell me. Also, unfortunately, deep learning hasn't solved everything yet, so for all of these methods, how you pre-process things, whether you standardize all your features before you start, makes a big difference to what you'll see and you have to have some of that experience. Hopefully, people in this room will be part of getting rid of needing that human experience to work out how to drive these methods. But in the meantime, you have to actually get some data and try these things and, and learn how to make them work. Okay, so we have these different ways of just fitting data unsupervised. PCA is a simple one. We just don't need labels, and we can have a look at what our data is like. We can fit these autoencoders or sequence models that use unlabeled data, and we think that they're doing something interesting. And the question is, how do we evaluate that apart from looking at really cool pictures and going, oh, isn't that cool? Um, and so for a long time, people working in unsupervised learning say, well, ultimately, we're interested in some downstream application. Like, we want things to work in a variety of different classification tasks, maybe ones we haven't anticipated. So what we'll do is we will take the features from inside this thing and then plug that into a classifier or maybe several classifiers for different problems and see whether they're useful features. And that's a proxy for whether we've sort of got some insight into what's going on. And I've put circa 2008 here because I, in 2008 is a year I can point to where I know I was doing this. Um, Russ Silikidanov and I were working on a series of Boltzmann machine models. These used to be trendy. Um, and so we had these unsupervised models of high dimensional data. And we would, to write the paper, we wanted to say, oh, here is how well they uh, help if you want to solve classification problems. So we literally had three models that increased in complexity, and we liked them as they got more complicated, and they got better unsupervised scores. So they were better at reconstructing data, or they assigned higher probabilities to data. And as we extracted the features from them, they literally got worse and worse and worse at being useful features for classification tasks. So if we had images and we got some hidden representation of them, we got worse image classification models if we extracted the hidden features. So it's not this sort of satisfying place to be. We're interested in deep learning because we think in the guts it's learning really interesting feature representations and it's doing good things. But we're a bit short on principles on exactly how that should work. There's a lot of heuristics for transfer learning, but really the only way to know whether they're going to work is to try them and run them, and that's a bit depressing. And um, I was uh, telling this to a visiting speaker we had in our department, it was Yair Weiss, and I was telling him this story, and it's a, it's a good tip to grad students that whenever you have a visiting speaker, do try and talk to them, because you have all these experts coming through and they will tell you things. So Yair Weiss said to me, but who told you that was going to work? Like he was just pointing out to me what I hadn't really thought about, that I didn't have a principle. I had nothing that said that having a good unsupervised score would lead to accuracy. And he said, well, you should be doing something that makes sense. So, um, so the, what I'm going to get into now is like an example of something that makes sense, something where we're like, yeah, that doing unsupervised learning here 
is the right thing to do, and that will motivate building large density estimation models. So I want to get you into a place where you believe that my research agenda actually makes sense before I give you some of the solutions. So what your advice was working on at the time was image denoising, and I feel a little bit hesitant to talk about this when John Skilling's sitting in the front row and he was doing image denoising in the 80s, um, and I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I'm just giving you a cartoon application that hopefully makes some sense. Imagine that you've got in mind that there's some clean image patch that you're interested in, but unfortunately you don't see that because you've got a noisy, crappy camera. The CCD in your camera phone is noisy and you get some noisy version of that underlying image patch. So we've got an inference problem. Given the mess we got out of our noisy device, what do we believe about what we would like to see underneath there? And you can write down Bayes rules saying that these beliefs are proportional to a likelihood and a prior. So in the simple case, this likelihood might be something fairly simple. So if we just thought that noise was scattered on top, this could be a Gaussian distribution where we think it's a Gaussian centered at the true image and the pixels will all be jittered around from that somehow and we've got a simple function here we can evaluate. If we think we've got blur as well, we'll have a convolution. But at least for our first toy workup problem, we could assume that this likelihood is something we can write down and we understand. So we're sorted, right? Um, yeah, and priors, oh, we can just do something vague. Who cares about priors? The, the problem with this Bayesian approach is that this prior has to be informative. If you put a uniform prior over images and you say maximize this distribution, it would just say return y. The most probable underlying image is the image you saw because that is the smallest amount of noise that was added and noise of zero has the highest probability density. So you have to inject knowledge that you want to see smooth images or images that are smooth at least in parts and have edges in them. And that knowledge has to come in the prior. And so someone needs to write a piece of computer code, a function that says um, what do images look like. If you were to draw a random image, how would you do that? And that's a complicated process. I mean, there's a whole branch of natural image statistics sort of in the cognitive science and neuroscience and machine learning literatures trying to understand that problem. But what we can do is get, at least if we've got small image patches, many, many samples from this distribution. So I could go to the web and just download images and cut out chunks from them. And I can get many, many examples of what images look like. So I can, this is a cartoon, but here are a bunch of chunks cut out from an image. They are samples of the, the process. I didn't need to build a model. I can just be data-driven and use data. But to implement this equation, I need a function that gives a number. Given an image, I want a single scalar, which is the probability. And I don't get that from these samples. So what I need is some way of turning these samples into a probability function so I can evaluate this equation. So that's density estimation. You've got a bunch of samples from a distribution and you want a function that says where did they come from. Um, so here in 1D I've got a bunch of crosses and this is a distribution saying where those crosses came from. And density estimation is from the data go to the function. And it's super, super hard. So there is no way from this data set I've shown that you can see the details of the knee of this curve. Um, it's a fun game you can play, actually. You can give people some points drawn from a uniform distribution and ask them to sketch the density they came from, and they'll draw all sorts of crazy things, and they'll be convinced that there's a dip in the density where there's a suspicious gap when, in fact, the density might be quite high. Um, and that only gets worse in higher dimensions. So if you've got two-dimensional points and you want to go to a two-dimensional density, then the data is usually sparser. And we in machine learning usually don't have one feature or two features. If we've got an image patch, I mean, even if it's tiny, if it's eight by eight, we've got 64 dimensional spaces. The theorists will tell you that density estimation is impossible um, and you should go home. So, but that's what we want to do if we want to do our learning from these samples and turn it into a, a probabilistic model. So what's the simplest density estimation method there is? I've got a bunch of points, and I want to fit a density to them. What should I do? Sorry? 
binning them? Yeah, so I could draw a histogram. Um, that, that's a, a good example, that's sort of a non-parametric method. If I wanted a, a parametric form, because maybe I'm wanting to deal with um, high dimensional spaces and very large numbers of images, so I don't want to hold all the images around or bin up my whole space, what might I do? What's the simplest parametric model? An isotropic Gaussian, that's even simpler than the one I've drawn on this slide. So yeah, we could fit a Gaussian, we could measure the mean and covariance of our data set, and if we wanted to save parameters, we could put constraints on the covariance and make it um, uh, spherical. And a Gaussian model wouldn't be a very good model of images, so in, it basically would correspond to a Gaussian process if you put a Gaussian over the pixel. So you could model sort of wavy, smooth surfaces, but what you couldn't model is in these patches, you may well see an edge or two that are in arbitrary places. You can't get that from a single Gaussian model. If you want to put an edge in a particular place so that all images have an edge in a particular place, you can model that with a Gaussian. But what you can't do is say there is some edge somewhere. So uh, what you could do is use a mixture of Gaussians. You could say, I've got more than one Gaussian, and the way to generate an image patch is pick one of them and then generate a point from that. So pick this Gaussian and then I'll generate a point from that. And this is a two-dimensional sketch. In high dimensions, they might even have the same mean. It might be that they all have mean of a, a gray, flat image, and the, it's all, the, all of the model is in the covariance. It tells you which pixels you can push up together to create an edge. So a mixture of Gaussians, it's in the textbooks as like a baseline density estimation method. It's in most of the machine learning textbooks. It's something we could fit to this problem. We've got a whole series of images, and what Zorin, um, Daniel Zorin and Yeo Weiss did was they just fit an enormous mixture of full covariance Gaussians to this data set, and they don't need to worry about overfitting because they can get as large a data set as they like. So we don't need to worry about sort of being careful and Bayesian and stuff. You just keep throwing more data at it until you think you can fit the parameters. So here's a figure from their paper. They did uh, deblurring and denoising. This is a deblurring one, so um, they have a blurred image. They find, I'm missing out some details about how they extend the model for a patch to the whole image, which was clever, but um, roughly speaking, they just used the equation I showed you and optimized to find the most probable image, given the blurred image, and they get slightly better results than the previous state of the art, which was itself a probabilistic approach, but using a prior where people had thought about images rather than this brute force sledgehammer, let's just fit the prior. So this was a problem where yeah, if I said it makes sense to do density estimation because we want that density in the equation that we're trying to do. And they did get a series of results where they tried a whole series of different density estimators. And the better the density estimator was, the better the imagery construction performance was measured in the way that uh, vision researchers would normally measure these things. So I thought that was um, sort of a nice example of how to start thinking about uh, doing research in this area if I'm going to do density estimation. It might be that in the end I'm wanting to push forward ideas of representation learning and machine learning, but I don't want to be stuck in this game of just cutting out features and throwing them into classifiers and running experiments. I want to be in a world where like, the task I'm doing makes sense directly, and that's a good space to develop the methods in. So. To give you an example of how general this is, what I'm going to do is turn the handle on exactly the same approach in a completely different area so that you can see that if you develop good density estimation techniques, it might be useful in several different applications. So I was at um, a conference talking to some cosmologists, and they told me about this uh, paper they'd worked on, and I thought, oh, this is maybe uh, something where we can do something a bit better. So they were really, this w wasn't sort of a whole serious analysis. This was a conceptual paper where they were saying, oh, here is a way that we can use data from simulations to tell us something about the universe we live in. And this paper was specifically about the Milky Way. So this is my Wikipedia level model uh, uh, knowledge of the Milky Way. This is the galaxy we live in. I think we're about here, something like that. Um, and this is a cartoon from Wikipedia that an artist has drawn because even in Star Trek, you can't get out here to take a picture of it. It's too far away. Um, even in Star Trek, they just move some small distance uh, within this thing. And um, on the right, we have the Magellanic Clouds, which are these small proto-galaxies which are orbiting around us. So the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud, which are themselves lots of stars. And 
there are things we don't know about them. So they're orbiting around us, but there is an argument about whether they have just shown up, like maybe they've orbited around us once or twice and they've been captured, or were they there from the beginning? Maybe they were spun out in the formation process of the Milky Way and they've been orbiting many times for the whole history of the Milky Way. Um, so there are inference problems that we want. We can look at these things and we can try and settle this argument. We also don't know how much stuff is here. We can't see most of it because there are stars in the way, but we also can't see most of it because most of it matter, we think. So this thing is sitting in the center of a much, much larger halo of dark matter, and hardly any of the mass is stuff you can see. So we could say, how massive is the Milky Way? So um, that's an inference problem. We could say, there are things we can measure. Why? Before that was a noisy image. Now it could be things we can see in telescopes, like we've got these uh, dwarf galaxies orbiting around us and they're this far away and they're moving this fast. So I'll have the radial position of the large Magellanic Cloud and its tangential velocity and I could shove more things into this vector, whatever I measure in a telescope. And then there are things I might want to infer, like what's the mass of the Milky Way? Um, what's the denoised versions of these quantities? Because I measured them with telescopes and I don't know exactly what they are. Um, and possibly, when did these things arrive? And these observations aren't necessarily directly observable. So the radial position of the Large Magellanic Cloud is something we've got a pretty uh, accurate measurement of, and there's a small error bar. The mass of the Milky Way, no direct measurement. When things arrived, not directly observable at all, unless you have a time machine. Um, so we have to be able to infer things from our observations. And just like in image denoising, Unless we have some prior knowledge about how these quantities relate to each other, which comes from physics, we can't make any progress. So we have models of how telescopes work, how wrong we might be in measuring things, but we also need a model about how those observations relate to things that we want to know. So where's that going to come from? One place it could come from is samples. So. Um, here are samples from something. They're samples from a simulator. So some people think they know how the universe works. What you can do is create a big box in your computer and fill it with gas that will condense into galaxies and simulate gravity. And so um, th these data come from the Bolshoi simulation, as in the large simulation. It took two years to run on a supercomputer. And out of it, many, many galaxies condense synthetic galaxies. And we know everything about those galaxies because we made them. So we know how massive they are. We know how many companions they have, when those companions arrived, how far away they are, how fast they're moving. And here I've just done some shonky visualization of some of those properties. So here I've got a histogram of all of the galaxies' masses that happen to have two companions, so the galaxies that look a bit like the Milky Way. And here I've got, so that was um, here, I've got this histogram. Here I've got a scatter plot of the mass of the galaxy versus the speed of the second companion, so probably the smallest companion, I can't remember. So what this um, scatter plot says is that if the speed is small, then probably the mass of the galaxy is small as well. And for reasons I don't understand, if the speed is big, then the mass could be small, or it might be really big, but for some reason it's not in between. So there's some complicated dependent distribution that's dropped out of the way the simulator works and the physics works. If the speed gets too big, that never happens because it wouldn't be a bound object. It would have flown off. So there's some constraints here. And there's also a bunch of suspicious looking constraints because of the definitions of something being the biggest companion or the smallest companion, or whether there's a cut saying whether something counts as a galaxy or not. So you have to have quite a long conversation to understand exactly what all of these weirdnesses in the data set look like. And it's a much longer question about whether you believe them and whether it makes sense to do inference on this data. But for the moment, let's assume that this makes sense. And here's what they did in this uh, uh, cosmology paper. They did important sampling, and we're now experts on important sampling. So they said, um, we have samples from our prior. We've got samples from the simulator saying what we think galaxies look like. So that's step one. And step two of important sampling is we color them in hues of purple, depending on how well they match the data. So we weight our samples with the likelihood. And then we use those weighted samples 
as if they were sort of example beliefs. So the things that the galaxies that don't match our data at all, they have the wrong number of companions, or the companions are way bigger or way smaller, um, we throw out. And the galaxies that came out of the simulation that look like the Milky Way, we go, oh, they look like the Milky Way according to the things we measured. Maybe other things about them are like us too. So we could see how massive they are. We could see when their companions arrived and when or whether they were spun out from the beginning. So here's their results. They, this Bolshoi simulation uh, condensed out 2 million synthetic galaxies. Of those, 40,000 had two companions. Of those, only about 400 were anything like the Milky Way. And what this figure is showing is a histogram Histograms are good density estimation methods. A histogram of basically those 400 samples saying what are the masses of those 400 galaxies that might be like the Milky Way. It's actually a weighted histogram of um, all 40,000 points, but um, you think of it as basically being of those 400. So this is what to believe about the mass of the Milky Way given this data. And in, we don't know by more than an order of magnitude. So is it 10 to the 12 suns or 10 to the 13 suns? Don't know, um, but no one else knows either, so that's okay. So on the, on the right-hand side are beliefs from other papers in the literature using various different methods, and they look like they're more certain, but they also disagree with each other. So the beliefs that we've got here look reasonable. They cover the beliefs that are in the literature. And now, and now we get finally get to the point where we think, well, could machine learning help here? We've got an inference method, important sampling that we kind of know sucks. Um, could we do something better? But we can't swap to MCMC or some other Monte Carlo method here because we can't evaluate the prior probability. All we can do is sample from the prior. All we've got is the simulator. And also, we can't get more samples because these two million samples were fucking expensive. And they weren't made for this project. They were made for other reasons. This is just something hanging off the side. We can't say, could we have two million more? And really, we'd like 20 million more, or uh, a lot more. We've only constrained our observations using a couple of observations, these uh, companion locations. If we add more observations, if we throw in everything we know about the Milky Way, this number of ones that match our observations would drop from 400 to zero, and we couldn't do anything. So what they said was, is there a way of getting more samples for free? Can you get magic pixie dust from machine learning to like do something for nothing and give us more samples? And we can't do that. But what we can do is try and do sensible smoothing and do density estimation. And it's possible that by doing that, it might extract interesting features about how the simulator works. But really, what we want is the actual density estimation task. So. Um, what we could do is say, let's go back to what we're doing. We've got Bayes' rule, but really we've got another source of data, which are these simulated galaxies. And this is our density estimation task. We want to estimate what we should believe about vectors of galaxy properties given our 40,000 simulated vectors. So we've got a bunch of vectors, turn it into a density. So I did that, and I started with fitting a single Gaussian. So I've got this quite complicated density, and in this seven-dimensional space, I've just put one rugby ball on top of it, split. Here is where the data are. I've measured a mean and covariance. And here are the results of doing that. So on the top, results from important sampling. On the bottom, I've got in purple what the mean mass and the standard deviation of the masses are in the data set. So this is just what you believe about galaxies. This is the range of masses in the simulation. And then using this seven-dimensional Gaussian, I can use that as a prior, do Bayesian inference, and say, what should I believe about the mass of the Milky Way? I've observed these things in the Milky Way. What's its posterior? And I get this slightly narrower belief. It's like, I don't really know. And it looks far broader than the important sampling. So what's gone on is there's all this structure, there's all this knowledge in the simulation, all these spikes and cutoffs say how the physics work. And I've just blurred all of that out and saying, oh, I don't really know stuff. And as a result, at the end of the analysis, I don't really know stuff. Um, so what I want to do is capture more of that knowledge. So I could go up to a mixture of Gaussians. I could put a whole load of rugby balls down and try and measure, uh, model all of these spikes and cutoffs. So I did that. Um, 
and I get a much tighter posterior that says, okay, I've got a much better idea of what the mass of the Milky Way is, and it's a nice smooth curve, unlike this noisy Monte Carlo rubbish. Um, but I could look at that and go, well, should I believe that? Have I, I, I've already seen that if I don't model the prior very well, I'm not going to get good results. Could I model this prior better? Could I do my density estimation better? Um, and I like to visualize things, so here again are the simulation samples, so each point on here corresponds to properties of a, a galaxy. I can fit my mixture of Gaussians, and I can sample from that. I can do what they asked me to do, give them more data. I can just say, here are more galaxies drawn from my model, and here's the same visualization. Yeah, those distributions are obviously different. So there are these weird cutoffs in this data set, and these are hard to model with rugby balls. You've got to very carefully stack very sharp rugby balls next to each other on the boundary. It's very hard to model this stuff, and it's pretty difficult to, with a reparameterization, remove all of these constraints as well. So we would like black box machine learning to be able to fit this density better. We're clearly not fitting it very well. Um, and we would hope that because density estimation is actually what we want, this prior we want, that that's a task that makes sense and we'll get better inferences. Okay, um, so I like mixtures of Gaussians. Um, they're used a lot in astronomy and other places because they're analytic and you can compute lots of things. But I want to push further and say, well, could I use the success of machine learning to fit things better? How would I, I do that? And the first thing I did was use an autoregressive model. So here's the idea of an autoregressive model. I have a whole vector of properties I want to model and they could take on real values. So it could be the pixel values in an image, but it could be properties of a galaxy, its mass, positions of companions, and things like that. And rather than modeling the whole thing at once using a Gaussian or a mixture of Gaussians, you just predict things one at a time. Just like when we predicted text of a review one character at a time, we go through each element and we predict it. Now we know characters are in a sequence, and so it makes sense to predict things in a sequence but you can predict anything in a sequence by just going through the things in some order. So um, I'm going to build a model that predicts the mass of a simulated galaxy. I say I don't know that. I'm going to ignore everything else and just give you a prediction of that mass. And then I get to peek at the mass. So I've got this vector, and I predict the first element. I then look at it and go, oh, OK, I'm now talking about a galaxy which is pretty massive. I've got a dark gray blob here. Um, now I'm going to predict the second feature. What's that? Oh, that's the position of the second companion. OK, so I've got a massive galaxy, so maybe it's further out because that's how the correlation works. So this prediction of what value will be in this box depends on the previous feature just like if you're predicting characters, the previous character depends on what you've read so far. So we need a bunch of models for one feature at a time, given all of the features that we've seen before. And each of these models is just a one-dimensional distribution that says what, what's going on here. And if we can predict all of those probabilities, we multiply them together, and we have a model of the whole vector. So for an image, it would look like this. Here is a small image patch, as used by Zorin and Weiss. If you predict this top left pixel, what can you do? Well, you just look at a histogram. Like, um, if you're predicting a one-dimensional distribution, histogram is the thing to do. So in green here is a histogram of what pixels look like in image patches, and you use that to make your prediction. Um, but if you look at some intermediate pixel where you assume you've seen all of the pixels that came before it in a raster scan order, you'll make some other prediction. So here is a predictive distribution of some intermediate pixel shown on a log scale. You go, OK, I think it's going to take a similar value to the pixel that was to the left of it and the one above it, and um, I'll be a lot more confident than I was before. So on a log scale, you can see this distribution is tighter than for the first pixel. And then there's a pixel here in the middle which is on the edge of an edge. So the pixel values are changing quite quickly, and so your predicted distribution should be broader. So an intelligent system would look at the pixels around and say, am I in a flat region? I'm pretty sure what's going on. Or does it look like things might suddenly change in a way I don't know? Or can I track an edge going through the image and predict how it will continue? So if you understand how images work, you can do much better at this prediction game. And if you understand how galaxies work, you can do better at this prediction game. And what we hope is that by getting good at this prediction game, you also encode knowledge about galaxies or about images. Can I just check when this session ends? Is it 12.30?
Okay, so how do I do each of these prediction games? Well, so this is super modern machine learning. Um, Chris Bishop wrote a tech report in 1994 that said how to make predictions about whole distributions. So what we're trying to do here is a whole distribution. I don't want to just guess what a pixel value is. I want to give a guess um, and say, oh, and here is how uncertain I am. Here is where it might be. And this technology, a mixture density network, is one way of saying here is what I think about this real valued quantity given some features. So it's a neural network that takes an input. The input is all of the things that you've looked at so far, so the top left hand corner of the image patch or all of the properties you've already predicted. Neural net stuff happens, so that could be any neural net, it could be a convnet, it could be a transformer, it could be a standard neural net, anything. And the, the difference is in the output layer. So instead of outputting a single number, a guess, we output a whole distribution. And there are many ways of representing a distribution. So I could just draw a histogram. Um, and what this neural network does is represent a mixture of Gaussians. But it's only a one-dimensional mixture of Gaussians. So um, it has a bunch of means and it has a bunch of widths. And it says how much you're going to use each component. So it outputs a bunch of parameters that you can turn into a sketch that says what you should believe. The simplest version of this would be to output a Gaussian. You could say, here is my guess, and here is an error bar saying how uncertain I am. And the model would learn, here is somewhere where I know what the image is doing. This is going to be the pixel value. And in another context, it would go, there's an edge here. Anything could happen. I have no idea what's going to happen. And it can summarize that knowledge. So um, what I did for the Milky Way problem was go through the galaxy vectors and predict them one at a time using precisely this architecture. And I did this calling existing code for this network and just put a for loop around it and said, here are a bunch of prediction problems. Please just fit them. And did this in the most naive way. So um, here were the original simulation samples I was fitting. I fit a bunch of separate models to fit all of these prediction tasks. And then that gives me another model. And I can sample from it by just running through each of my models and saying to the first model, please give me a mass. And saying to the second model, here's a mass, give me a velocity. The third model, here's a mass and a velocity, give me another velocity, and so on. So I ran that, and then here are samples from that model. So then I'm flipping here between the true data and the simulated data. And the things around the edges move because they're outliers and they're weird. But these distributions are a lot closer. And I'm not saying that I've learned all of physics and I haven't learned how galaxies really work, but I've been doing a better job than the mixture of Gaussians. And quantitatively, that works too. So I used held out data, as we always should. And on held out data, the density estimator generalizes much better and predicts the vectors much better. And then, as you would hope, if you put that more detailed prior knowledge that uh, locks on to have into the analysis, you get much tighter posterior beliefs. So here was the posterior beliefs about the mass of the Milky Way with our mixture of Gaussians prior. If I use the density estimator, I've suddenly got a much tighter distribution that actually matches what the important sampling did a lot more closely. Um, but it all looks a lot smoother. It's not relying on this Monte Carlo approximation. It can do some interpolation. And we hope that it would scale to more interesting problems. Unfortunately, I couldn't resolve this question of when these companions arrived because the beliefs, according to my model, were, yeah, either could have happened. So um, that was the answer I got. Um, and I, that might be that you know we just cannot tell from the observations we have, uh, no matter how clever our computation is. OK. So um, I'm, I hope that I've done some job of convincing you that density estimation is a sort of smoothing job which is of use in its own right. It's something that I think is a useful tool to have for scientific data analysis and for various tasks. But also, it's something that's very easy to get data for. If you don't need labeled data, it's something you can fit in lots of domains. And there's at least a hope that the internal representation will be useful. And I'll say slightly more about that next time. Um, but given that motivation, the next question is like, okay, how can we do this better? Um, what I just showed you was me writing a few lines of code, hackily piecing together some code from the 90s. Um, how, how should we use modern machine learning to do density estimation? And there are lots of possible answers to that question. So um, what I 
won't talk about, um, for the interest of time, are a few methods. So I'm not going to talk further about mixture models. Mixtures of Gaussians actually work surprisingly well on this image patch system. But when you fit these components, it's very difficult to get them to share parameters and so really learn some interesting representation other than possibly a clustering. So mixture models are good for smoothing, but my intuition is they're not going to be the way forward if we want things that capture interesting dependencies and complicated data. And I'm not going to talk about um, GANs and VAEs because you've already heard a metric ton of stuff about those methods. Um, and also because they're not what I'm personally excited about, so I'll tell you why I'm not personally excited about them. I think they're both really cool, and I'm glad people are working on them. They're just not what I want to work on. So um, GANs seem to be really, really good at producing amazing-looking pictures. They could produce much better image patches than what I've shown you so far. But what they don't give you is what the probability of that patch is. So for the applications I'm going to show you, I don't know how to drop GANs in. And they're a lot more complicated and involved to reason about how to go about fitting them. I'd rather start on firmer ground of more standard looking machine learning methods. And I would see introducing an adversarial objective as a last resort if it's something that I need to do rather than doing it for the fun of it. Um, and I, I don't think it's just for scientific data analysis. I've seen in sort of industry consulting as well, if I want to produce a structured object, like laying out a bunch of things on a page, you might be able to get some generative process to do a good job of that. But if you want to analyze offline data that you've gathered before under different policies, you want to be able to score what went before in an even setting with other approaches. And it's difficult to do that when GANs play their own game and don't give you a score that you can directly compare with other methods. Um, and the uh, uh, people can argue with me about that in the break. But um, for me, they're not the, the first obvious approach to solve this sort of problem. Um, variational autoencoders are beautiful probabilistic models, and I really like them. They involve having latent variables and quite elaborate inference. And I'm already doing elaborate inference if I'm doing, say, scientific data analysis. I've got a model with its own variables and unknowns, and I'm trying to do inference. I want to get neural nets to help me do the inference, and I don't want to introduce inference problems that might be harder than the one I started with. So I want to see how far I can get with things that are technologically less fancy than a variational autoencoder and see how far I can get first and then consider being Bayesian on top at the end maybe. So I just want to talk about architectures and functions and representations of distributions and not get bogged down in particular ways of doing inference or training them. So what I am going to do is talk a bit more about autoregressive models. So I've shown you the simplest version. And we go, where can we go with that idea? What else can we do? Um, is it going to work? And at least two other principles for how to fit models in machine learning. There are lots of competing ideas in this space about how you go about representing this complicated output, a whole probability density over a large vector. That's a large output. and I'm thinking, OK, I've got a new large output. What have people done before? What are the ideas and various applications? What's the general underlying thing that I can reuse? So this is lying at the intersection of machine learning and statistics. I'm wanting to do a classic statistical task, density estimation, that has a large statistics literature. And I'm wanting to use machine learning ideas. And so I find myself talking to statisticians and applied people as well as machine learning researchers. And it's interesting that um, uh, statisticians are obviously, correctly, very skeptical about this line of research for multiple reasons. Firstly, density estimation in more than like four dimensions is impossible. And secondly, you can't possibly reasonably fit a model with a billion parameters. In fact, you know, um, it's, it's scary to think about fitting hundreds of thousands of parameters. And how can this possibly be justified if you're doing density estimation? And um, I, I picked up this example that helps talk to statisticians and say, you know, if you're modeling large data sets and image patches, these things can be quite reasonable at a, at a previous summer school. So Bruno Althausen um, told me this example. So I wanted to share it with you because it, it just made me sleep a bit better and feel a bit better. So 
Um, this was someone who uh, has done a lot of uh, analysis of the vision system and was talking about the literature of experiments on monkeys. So for monkey, uh, the monkeys, the overall layout of the brain is very similar to humans. Uh, we both have the visual processing at the back of the head, so um, light hits our eyes, and then more or less the signal after some processing in the retina goes straight to the back of the head. There's an um, intermediate thing called the retinal ganglion nucleus in the middle, something like that, and then it goes to the back, and there's a lot of early visual processing. The very back of the head is concerned with extracting edges and points, saying where are the main points of intensity in what you're looking at and where are the main changes. And you can do that with brutal experiments where you put in an electrode and you move things in front of the monkey's vision and you see which neurons fire. So much like we look at autoencoders and see which neurons fire, that's inspired by doing the same thing on real brains. And you can do it with epileptic patients with humans as well, so we, we have some idea that human brains are the same. So this visual processing just as very simple stuff, extracting images and points, and then there are other layers of visual processing that we believe form higher level representations, and you know, reasoning happens much further downstream. So, if you look at what's going on in the retina, you don't have a square grid of pixels, but you do have quite pixel-like objects that measure light in some bin, and then send it back. And so you, here is a cartoon of what 14 by 14 pixels look like. Um, you don't see very much in a small image patch. This is an image of the tip of my nose, and uh, you can see sort of a couple of edges in it, and a lot of image patches will just look flat. So, you know, most of what you can do is just extract. Is there an edge here? Maybe there's a junction, and where is it? And maybe something about the overall intensity. So that's the sort of processing we want to do to a, an image patch. So how much resource do we attach to that task? So um, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, our visual system is really expensive. It's a large part of the energy that our brain uses. It makes our head bigger, which means lots of us used to die in childbirth and lots of mothers used to die in childbirth. So presumably it's worth it. Presumably like the number of neurons we're dedicating to this task sufficiently offsets deaths in childbirth and deaths due to starvation that um, that visual system is worth it. So how many neurons do we use? How many V1 neurons are looking at this tiny patch? And I've got the answer for macaque monkeys. So what's the order of magnitude? Is it 10? Is it 20 trillion? Is it somewhere in between? Any, any? 100,000, someone knows the answer. So um, Bruno Olshausen said, yep, it's 100,000. And here is what 100,000 looks like. So he used this image in his talk. This is the Rose Bowl Stadium, and here is 100,000 people. So you can imagine each of these heads looking in in great detail at that. Um, so it's an enormous amount of resource because a, a neuron in the brain is not one number. It's not a free parameter. It's a complicated object that does a lot of stuff. If we want to simulate one neuron carefully, that, that's difficult. Um, so suddenly I felt a lot less bad about the number of free parameters we were needing to represent tiny image patches. It might be there's a cleverer way of doing it, and it would be great if we discover that. But actually, underfitting is our biggest problem, and we are needing to throw sort of this sort of order of magnitude, this is the entry point, 100,000 free parameters, probably millions. We're now routinely in universities fitting neural nets with hundreds of millions of parameters, and then we think a bit about the computation if it needs to go bigger than that. So, I'll give you um, some sense of where this is going to go. Uh, I'll start with the autoregressive models and then we'll move on to sort of comparing the approaches and the, the details of the tricks next time. So I've shown you this idea of predicting things one at a time. Why isn't that enough? Why do I need to stop? Um, there's a long literature on autoregressive models. And I mean, it's obviously an old statistical idea and here are papers from the machine learning literature. The problem is that we want to make these things scale. So I've got an image patch and it could contain hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of image, uh, pixels. I've got generic data from some scientific data analysis problem, and it might have all sorts of different features in it. And here is the product rule or the chain rule, and I need to fit each of these conditional probabilities, so the probability of a feature given all the previous features in some ordering. And the obvious thing to do is to just say, oh, I've got a bunch of probabilities, I'll throw a separate neural network at each of those. So um, 
uh, if I've got different features like massive Milky Way, velocity of a companion, the features could be different, some could be discrete, some could be real valued. I might need different models here. So in general, if I've got D features, I'll need D networks, one to model each of these terms. And then how many free parameters will those models contain? Well, most neural networks, if they've got a hidden layer with H units, um, or uh, do order dh computation. So here we've got order d parameter uh, features that we're looking at. So there'll be a matrix multiply where we look at these order d parameters and do h work on them. So that's the typical cost of one neural network. If it's got d inputs and h hidden units, it's an order dh matrix multiply in there. So that's the cost of one network, but we've got d of them. So the overall cost is order d squared h. So Often the number of hidden units in a neural net is comparable to the number of features we have. So this is like cubic in dimensionality. So sort of a rule of thumb with complexity is that cubic doesn't scale, right? I think the, there used to be a, a rule in the GCC compiler that like no one could commit code that was more expensive than n log n in any n um, unless you made a really good argument for it because someone will come along with an input that breaks it. Um, the reason that we tend to like uh, neural networks is that we've got training methods that scale both with the number of data points, we've got mini batch training algorithms that sort of look roughly linear in the size of the data set, but also the cost with dimensionality doesn't blow up. We can model very high dimensional feature spaces and it's at worst sort of qu quadratic and if D is huge we might make H smaller than D and keep it under control. But if we make H small here, we're still at least quadratic in this feature set, and it's going to be a hard constraint on what we can do. So I got this um, Galaxy demo to work, but that wouldn't have worked for image patches, it wouldn't have worked for speech, and it wouldn't have worked for bigger applications. So we needed other ideas, and as soon as we're exploring a bigger space of machine learning methods, there's a lot of choices, and we have to work out how we're going to do it. So um, I think what I'll do is wrap up there so that next time I can start with like, okay, this is the task we're going to do. We want to do density estimation that's flexible and scales and we'll apply to these applications and we'll do a deep dive on like what the ideas are and the tricks are and how they apply to other things. So I'll see you tomorrow.